Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the Independent Outlook, coming to you from the Independent Institute here in Oakland, California. We're right across the bay from San Francisco. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, a bunch of interesting topics that are in the news, including uh, some of the unusual and unexpected roots of current street violence. We may mention woke football a little bit. Um, we may also talk about uh, the fires in California and what's really behind them. Uh, thanks for joining us for this broadcast. Also, thank you to ThinkSpot, our partners in this enterprise, and to all of our friends around the country and even overseas uh, who have joined us for this conversation today and who stand with the Independent Institute in our work, which is to promote an independent way of thinking about a variety of issues that make a big difference in the world today. Uh, for our conversation, um, I am joined uh, by my colleagues. Uh, first of all, uh, David Thoreau. Welcome, David. Thank you. Welcome to you. It's always a pleasure to have David Thoreau. Uh, David Thoreau started the Independent Institute uh, some 34 years ago and uh, is a publisher of many, many books and sponsored a lot of serious research over the decades. Also, we're delighted to have Dr. Williamson Evers. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. So glad you're here. Dr. Evers uh, is the director of our Center on Educational Excellence. Um, and uh, he is a pleasure to talk about the issues of the day with because you never can tell what Bill Evers is going to say. So, okay, um, here we are, friends, uh, on uh, this September 16th, 2020. Um, you know, I can't not begin, I think, this conversation without mentioning, I think it's just three days ago here in California, in Southern California, uh, two police officers were ambushed. Um, and hospitalized. Uh, one's a 31-year-old uh, woman, mother, police officer, uh, and a 24-year-old uh, male police officer. Um, uh, it's stunning that they were, it, it kind of had the appearance of, of a, an execution, you know, m not your typical uh, s local agitation, but something very um, premeditated. Uh, when they were taken to the hospital, I remember seeing in the news a couple days ago that there were protesting crowds out there uh, yelling, you know, let the police die and so forth. Um, pretty stunning. Um, did you follow this more closely, Bill, since you're in Southern California? I learned about it as soon as the news had it, and it is, of course, very sinister. Uh, people protesting outside this hospital and blocking emergency vehicles from going in uh, mm -hmm. is an additional diabolical side to this. I, I also say, you know, I, I think this is the key horror, but the police also mishandled this slightly, at least a demonstration. They arrested an NPR radio reporter claiming she didn't have press ID, but you could see in the video it was hanging from her neck, claiming that ah, she mm -hmm. rushed the police whereas the video shows she didn't. So hmm. this reminds us that we also, not, we not only need law and order and we need virtue and people not doing evil things, but we also need the police to behave themselves. Yeah, we do for sure. But it's hard when these circumstances involve these kind of street skirmishes and uh, premeditated ambushes. I mean, obviously uh, I'm not it happy certainly that looks like a premeditated. It certainly yeah. looks like a premeditated ambush. Right, and then the people at the hospital are yelling, we hope they die, and of course blocking the ambulance from bringing the, the injured in. Uh, the police view of the journalist was that she tried to interfere with the arrests, and they did not ID her for whatever reason as from the media. Um, so I think there's a lot of confusion. Um, now, this is apparently, I think this year so far, we've had 40 police officers uh, killed, eight ambushed. Um, so, you know, this is just accelerating. And it really is, it, as you say, it's, it's demonic, really. Um, and the fact that people are in, impassioned to do this kind of thing, and they believe they're achieving something of a just nature, is a pitiful comment on That's the horrible. current political discussion, right? What you see going on, uh, it's not um, what I hoped it would be at the beginning of this season of protest. Namely, you know, you get crowds who have legitimate grievances and they get a little rowdy and tussly and occasionally, you know, something unintended happens. Uh, that's bad enough. 
Um, but this doesn't look like that at all. Uh, this is part of a whole series of incidents where it looks like uh, not not merely you know kind of the natural overflow of a little bit overzealous protesting, but actually a pretty concerted effort uh, to to undertake violence and. You know, what I find disturbing is that uh, the violence that's being undertaken in the name of justice um, is being carried out uh, by people who are, some of, the, some of the people seem to be, you know, uh, innocently chanting things like Black Lives Matter. But when you look at the Black Lives Matter organization, uh, when you look at the fact that they acknowledge themselves to be trained Marxists, uh, and you see the pattern here, it really looks to me like we have some highly motivated, ideologically driven cadres of people who are taking the opportunity through this discontent uh, to really drive up the level of violence in the name of their high goals. Right. And of course, the the idea of seeking justice for, for innocent black people um, has been tossed aside because if you look at the number of innocent blacks who have been killed in the riots, right. uh, mm -hmm. especially the, the uh, ones uh, essentially implemented by some of these dedicated Black Lives Matter, Matter activists, um, in addition to all the injuries and deaths from the fires and, and the, uh, the the outright violence itself, uh, it seems like there's little interest in um, having Black Lives Matter. It seems to be something that is put aside and not really considered to be a consistent concern. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that this is done in the name of justice, but the justice they're talking about is not justice between people, honest dealing. It's not justice in the sense of each person receiving their due, which is the famous classic mm -hmm. definition in the Justinian Code. It's some kind of coercive utopian ideal uh, in which there is either some kind of racial hegemony or some kind of impossible equality or something like this is an unattainable goal and one that even trying to effectuate would lead to totalitarian horror mm -hmm. and yet these people are impassioned about it and you know all of us all three of us and all of our our listeners i think are for justice but we just understand it in a systematic way and mm -hmm. you know in in history, there have been other kinds of strange people that thought, well, I'm campaigning for justice. I'm bringing into effect the preparation for the second coming of Jesus or whatever goal they have. I'm here to bring about Marx's transcending of the bourgeois society. They have these millenarian goals, unattainable, but still fanatical, enthusiast goals. And it justifies doing anything. It's right. a very, just, very frightening thing. The end justifies the means is the default if people give up the natural law tradition of, That's right. mm -hmm. of ethics and so forth and common decency and the golden rule. And, you know, the... The riot there, as Graham, you were saying, there are many legitimate uh, concerns that people have and people of good uh, will who are trying to pursue that. But there is a group, which I think is a small group, uh, which wants to take advantage of this for their own ideological purpose. And others, obviously, professional criminals who are taking advantage of the yeah, situation to line their pockets right. and so on. So we have seen some police reform in some places, like yeah, in right. Colorado, they pass qualified immunity, getting rid of qualified immunity, which is this thing that even if a policeman or some other government official engages in unconstitutional acts, if no one has done it before, then they get off. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Yeah. So they, they got rid of it there with, with some caps on how much an individual policeman could be held responsible for financially. On the other hand, police reform in California was very trickily held off by the Democratic leadership in the state state legislature. They used all kinds of stalling tactics until the session ran out, and they did it on purpose. And all the newspaper accounts acknowledged that the police union pressure 
was mm-hmm. the thing that prevented these yep. sensible, right. widely supported mm-hmm. yep. mm-hmm. reforms by the That's right. Yes, sensible reforms. Um, I want to come back just for a moment to a comment, David, you made a moment ago. Um, you said, you know, the part of the rationale here is the end justifies the means, and that's a pretty common human rationalization. But I really do think that the the really ideologically driven um, people involved in the violence, possibly including the ones who shot the police officers in Los Angeles and certainly many others, it's not just, you know, the end justifies the means. It's a certain understanding of the end. That's kind of a comprehensive social transformation is the end. A mm-hmm. pure transcendent justice is the end. Um, I would just want to uh, draw people's attention to the fact that we published on our blog a really fascinating piece by Angela Codavia on millenarian mobs. Uh, 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 Bill alluded to this a moment ago, which illustrates the ways in which the really um, highly uh, ideologically driven people, the end is a kind of utopia that they have in mind. And you know, if the end is so high and so perfect, if it's like with Karl Marx, that by driving history forward into its final stage, we will eliminate all the tensions of human existence right. and eradicate every form of injustice. Well, if that's just over the horizon, then really what's, I mean, you just gotta push it with a little violence. That's the Leninist, yeah. that's the Marxist approach. It uh, it's the, the Hitlerian approach. Uh, in Angelo uh, Codavia's piece, he comments uh, that Hitler wrote once that only he and Stalin really were the true revolutionaries because unlike Mussolini, Hitler said, uh, he and Stalin were tearing down their country's intellectual and physical ties to the past. So statues, churches, um, uh, all of the symbolic stuff that's being done, all of it, it we, our civilization has been here before. This is the people who are at the cutting edge of the violence are not simply unhappy with you know, uh, police and needing some reforms, they want to transform human society. And when you feel that that's within your reach, boy, you can justify a lot. You can justify a lot. And, and uh, what uh, Angelo does, by the way, I should mention that the article originally appeared in the Claremont Review of Books. Um, so Angelo basically is pointing out that people who um, consider themselves to have been cleansed um, essentially cleanse themselves or with some sort of institution they've created uh, can take on this pride in which they are justified to rule others. And if others don't agree with their vision, they have the right to eliminate them and anyone who stands in their way. So there's no discussion. Of course, you have this insular uh, nature to it. Um, there are many books on this subject uh, that uh, we would invite people to look at. Darkness at Noon is, is one of them I recommend. Um, but in any event, the, the lesson here is that this millenarian compulsion uh, is, is extremely dangerous. Right. And there, there's no way to quench it um, as long as someone believes that they are this uh, sort of secular godly force Mm -hmm. uh, to essentially transform not just um, the world, but human nature itself. That's right. That's the goal of Marxism. Right. If you don't don't conform to that, then you are part of the problem and need to be eliminated. Mm -hmm. And anything you draw from history or culture that supports your view that's counter to this vision needs to be destroyed too. So Darkness at Noon that David just mentioned is a famous novel by Arthur Kessler. Right. And in it, a leading Russian communist is imprisoned uh, during the equivalent of the Stalin purges. And he confesses to something that he knows he didn't do and his interrogator knows he didn't do, but he does it for the sake of the party and the cause and the historical mission. And this is a complete example of this sort of thing. And, and this is a book about one of these things. So this is a, about a man who declared himself the king of a city in Germany. And he thought that the millennium was coming and he was going to push it over the edge by having this city and then going on to essentially conquer the world 
And it was on behalf of all the, the poor downtrodden people yeah. that he was supposedly their champion. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And one of the dangers in this is something that can have a relatively benign thing, this idea of the inner spirit, so consulting yourself rather than mm -hmm. an objective moral code. So mm -hmm. you're right. somehow you're reaching inside yourself. Okay, so we find that in Henry David Thoreau, other spelling. You find that in Quakers, you find that in the uh, Puritan dissident Anne Hutchison, but they are doing this within the view of bourgeois virtues within property rights, within constitutional liberties. They're not just anything goes. They have this reaching into themselves, but they have some sense of objective boundaries. The problem with our current millenarians. Like their spiritual predecessors in the Middle Ages. Exactly the same, is they think they know it all. and no, even reasoning with them, even showing them evidence, that's part of the problem. That's right. Right. I'd like to make a, a book plug too, and the plug would be for a book uh, called The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis. It's Lewis's book on the natural law, and Bill's referring to people who uh, instinctively know that there is this uh, sense of moral right and wrong sort of written on your heart. Right. Uh, and what Lewis does in the book is he basically critiques subjectivism in epistemology, aesthetics, and ethics. And he shows the absurdity that comes out of uh, essentially uh, claiming there is no objective standard. Uh, he basically shows not only is it is absurd to claim there is no objective standard, but whatever standard you pick, um, you have one of your one of your feet still is in the natural law tradition. And one of the most interesting parts of the book, is at the end, there's an appendix in which Lewis goes through all these ancient documents and shows in the ancient Bab Babylonia and China and Egypt and all over the world, all these civilizations had a code of the natural law. They were not all perfect. I love that section of that book. Right, right. but the folk knew about this, and that's how the civilization could exist. The rulers might trample on it, and, and the bulk of them did. But the fact that this natural law existed, this idea that we're seeking something beyond survival and meaning and relationships and so on and so forth. So if you translate that in sort of the millenarian sense, that instead of uh, looking out to a standard uh, in Lewis's sense, of course, a theological standard, of objective morality that you're subject to, you turn inward and you're the you're the, the standard. And if right. you turn inward completely, there is no standard. So anything goes. Or you just become part of the whims of, of others. The, yeah. So the Quakers, famous for opposing slavery, a wonderful thing that they did in opposing slavery. Right. And yet, mm -hmm. if you look at the Quakers today, that's kind of like you know, whatever woke progressive something that's just <laughs> Nowadays, popping in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's partly because although they have a lot of good attributes, they don't have quite enough anchor into objective morality mm -hmm. because of this inner spirit idea. I, I want to mention that somewhat like what C.S. Lewis is doing in John Locke's works on morality and on religion, Yes. He is mm -hmm. also trying to find a moral consensus. And within mm -hmm. Christianity, he's yeah. trying to find a common ground of Christianity. What are the essentials? Yes, we can argue about the less important things, but what is a consensus that we can, that all Christians can agree on, and between Christians and Muslims and Christians and Jews and so mm -hmm. forth? What are these things? And he tries to discover that. And uh, it actually does a fairly good job. And I think one of the one of Chodovia's points is that in the modern era, um, when you abandon the idea that there is a non-natural ground for this, uh, a non-materialistic ground, then you are secularized into believing that you're the, you are the source yeah. of it. Right. And right. That's, that's the trouble. Yeah. And all hell that's right. breaks loose. We'll, we'll reassure our friends who are with us that we're going to come up out of these deep wa the deep waters <laughs> in a minute <laughs> in a minute here. But yes, uh, historically, you know, uh, theologically in Western civilization, um, 
for example, both in the Hebrew scriptures in the book of Daniel and in the Christian scriptures in the book of Revelation, there is a vision of a perfect future where God's justice prevails. But in both cases, uh, in the Hebrew theological framework and the Christian one, um, it is by the action of God at the end of history, not by any human effort that those things are attained. Right. But when the secularization occurs, that impulse to that perfect future doesn't disappear. It just gets kind of transmuted and subjectivized and really untethered and dangerous. So Right, and it reinforces, as Lewis points out, in the abolition of man, the danger, the importance of the natural law, but also the danger of seeking to abandon or ignore it. Many, many people have noted that uh, uh, Karl Marx's view of history very much looks like uh, a biblical view shorn of God, yeah. but still pushing toward perfection through human power. Uh, it's pretty scary. So, um, you know, and uh, as I already said, the uh, one of the founders, or maybe more than one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement acknowledges that they're trained Marxists. So, um, to come back out of the deep waters, you know, at the recent Kansas City Chiefs opening game, uh, they decided to put up on the scorecard a bunch of the latest woke slogans. You know, I'm looking at uh, our own piece that was published by William Watkins on our Beacon blog, which I encourage you to take a look at. Kansas City uh, fans were right to boo the Chiefs opening game. That's because up on the uh, uh, the scoreboard, they put a bunch of these current slogans. Uh, we must end racism. We must believe in justice for all. We must end police brutality. We believe Black Lives Matter. And of course, Black Lives Matter is capitalized here. So it's hard to say that they're not referring to the formalized movement. And so a bunch of the fans booed. And you know, then they, they got castigated by a bunch of newspapers, NBC News, Kansas City Star, Sports Illustrated, all had these nasty comments about the, the fans who did some scattered booing. But you know, I can't really blame the fans because it's not like those slogans were put up there as a kind of inclusive signal of unity. To me, those slogans in the current context um, are really ideologically charged you know, statements that are signaling to the world that they're standing with this really highly developed and radical ideological formulation. Why should the fans sit by and be happy that they're being hectored by a very partisan, ideological, one-sided sloganeering. They're not just being sloganeered, they're, uh, and they're essentially being blamed. And they're That's being right. blamed in a way that they cannot stop being responsible. They are intrinsically responsible, and nothing they do can change that. That's one of the real problems with the idea of systemic racism or institutional racism, is right. that it's this view that on the, on the collective scale, we have this built-in racist situation, and the only way to eliminate it is to eliminate that collective connection. And so ultimately, you end up with a racist interpretation. And so the fans are saying, I, I'm not going to take responsibility for this yeah. because I'm not responsible, and I'm against black lives being harmed or any other person. Absolutely. Yeah. So it gets, it gets into this millenarian sort of mindset uh, it doesn't have the intensity now that right. these past movements have had, obviously. But mm -hmm. I do think it it is a seduction, a temptation into removing yourself from taking responsibility to take action. I mean, these players mm -hmm. are are all millionaires. Um, right. If if you look at basketball, LeBron James is who knows how much he's worth. Right. Well, more power to him. Right, and at his house, he has a white cook and a white driver, and and so, but somehow he's not racist. It's mm -hmm. the, it's all those other unwashed people that um, he wants to uh, castigate. I find it slightly encouraging that ordinary fans may have, without all the you know philosophical training, they have like a little bit of radar that they detect when they are being you know implicitly vilified, and they don't like it. And if they're buying, you know, a, a, what a ticket is probably one hundred and sixty dollars or something. They're mm -hmm. going to see football players who are multimillionaires. Right. The bulk of them are black. So why is that racist to reward those people for their skills and camaraderie? Mm -hmm. um, the same thing in basketball and other sports. Uh, not to mention many different entertainment fields. So it seems to me that if the, if the fans demanded that the players be white, then 
you know, that'd oh, be that'd something be... to look at. But that's the yeah. opposite is happening. Right, exactly. So, you know, whenever you hear this word systemic these days in context, it does seem to mean that somehow radically from deep down inside our rule of law, free market, uh, moral, middle class morality system that there's some horrible, horrible evil from it's the root from which it grows. And um, that makes me want to ask you, uh, Bill Evers, I think you brought this to my attention that New York Times recently uh, had a long piece on Milton Friedman's defense of uh, free market capitalism, uh, kind of in this mode of attacking systemic injustice. But what was that all about and why was Friedman attacked? Well, I think he was attacked as a symbol of laissez-faire capitalism. And he wrote some years ago, he's just dead now, of course, he wrote some time ago uh, an article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine, back when it was a serious <laughs> magazine, uh, an essay called The Social Responsibility of Business is to Make Profit. And so they reprinted from this, and then they had little linked, hyperlinked type comments on it and some attached essays. Hmm. And uh, with one minor exception from a reasonable person commenting, David Henderson, the rest of them were all progressives lambasting uh, any focus on profit. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, Friedman had his own view. He was a kind of rule utilitarian. It's not my own exact philosophy and my own moral views, but it's a serious view. And he emphasized in the article that he was talking about within the rule of law, pursuing profit. Right. Mm -hmm. He was not just saying like a willy-nilly nihilist out to plow through anybody murdering people for profit or something like that. He's, of course, against that. Uh, so it was a, it's an unfair characterization of yeah, Milton Friedman was not a, a character in an Ayn Rand novel. Well, even Ayn Rand characters are not characters in an Ayn Rand novel. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's okay. another old story. The point is, uh, he he wanted to pursue a benevolent view of companies as advancing the overall wealth and prosperity of society mm -hmm. and the right. people interacting in trades back and forth and in employment deals and so forth. And uh, he did not have a dark view of how uh, business and commerce proceed. So it's part of this, the systemic hides careful analysis. It's just right. a broad brush. Mm -hmm. These people are painting with a broad brush. Instead of intellectually defending or trying to critique something, they just want to pin some kind of label on it and refuse to examine it closely and sensibly. I, I think, Graham, you and David both probably have some thoughts on this, but the key thing is honest profit. The key thing is mm -hmm. profit pursued within valid laws, within the actors in the company, uh, behaving morally and honestly, then That's of course right. you should focus on profit, and that is your commercial responsibility to the owners, shareholders. But you're a human whatever. person before yes. you are a business leader. That is right, and profit is not everything. Mm -hmm. Being a good person is everything, and profit can come within that. It's a secondary good that we should embrace as such. And profit is simply uh, having more revenues than expenses. Yeah, There's nothing right. more complicated than that. And if your purpose is to um, represent the shareholders who've come together right. in some sort of joint stock or partnership right. arrangement. Right, kind of partnership. That's the, right. purpose, the mission is to raise money through producing goods and services. And the only way you can, you can make that work is to have more revenues than expenses. That's right. And that's the only way you can pay your workers. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, but the, the contract among the shareholders and the employees and everybody else depends upon one trust. Trust is the basis of all relationships, first of all. You can't just do whatever you want. You have to do things that are in keeping with that contract. So you don't just abuse people, you don't defraud them, you don't just fire people necessarily 
for no purpose, et cetera, et cetera. And you have an incentive to maximize your, your returns and having decisions that will do that. And one of the great examples was uh, Henry Ford when he raised, what was he, doubled or something, the wage rates of, of his employees. And people said, why are you doing this? And it ultimately meant he was able to attract better people exactly. and the company right. was more productive. And he could, he could, they would stay on. So the That's training right. that he they had, had developed was reliable. Right. And you also, you develop a reputation. Exactly. So part of success, is, David is stressing trust, but yeah. another way of saying it is reputation. Yes, well, mm -hmm. reputation is part of trust, I would say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They are they are intertwined. And so I'm very suspicious of this movement of so-called social, socially responsible capitalism or whatever. Right, stakeholder capitalism. Yeah, yeah. which minimizes, right. you know, you should su suppress your profitability for the sake of other yeah. goals. And I'm thinking to myself, isn't there something immoral about that? Yes, because it's politicians and special interest groups deciding what your goal is and not the owners of the company. Right. And the owners of the company are widely dispersed. I mean, for example, think of all the... Uh, retirees who have invested in various funds and whatever, and uh, e even public employees. You know, I'm no big fan of public employee unions, but the California p uh, pension system is one of the biggest uh, institutional investors in the world. And, and there are, you know, thousands and thousands of current and future retirees among even public employees whose future depends upon these companies being profitable rather than diverting resources away from profitability, to, which would then impoverish the people who are depending upon these equities for their retirement. I think social responsibility is probably unethical, in, understood in well, that way. But it doesn't mean that the decision makers in the company can't engage sometimes in charitable works. Yes. Of course. Mm -hmm. they, they can do that. They're human beings. Yeah. And they want to lead moral lives, and they they do have obligations to the stockholders or other owners. And but charity can be consistent with that, you yes. know. And if they don't like it, the investor should go to another company. And I mean, the the polar opposites as far as uh, making choices. Um, could be described as one pecuniary being completely based on financial questions versus not pecuniary. Right. But no right. decision, virtually no decision in our life is one or the other. That's right. Um, but by and large, most decisions lean towards the non pecuniary considerations. And ultimately, all wealth comes from factors that are not merely pecuniary factors. That's right. That's what I mentioned. Said all relationships, business, family, people that you see on the street, the, the community you live in, the churches, whatever, is mm -hmm. all based on relationships. And that's, that's right. grounded in trust. Mm -hmm. And so there's a natural law component to all these different institutions and relationships. And if the mission of one of these or many of these organizations is to maximize revenues uh, as far as profit over expenses. And you're accountable to the people who put up money expecting you to perform to deliver on that. And you decide to make decisions that don't do that. Then you're defrauding those people. That's right. You're defrauding your employees who can't get as much income as far as mm -hmm. their wages. And the consumer, as far as the product, good, or, good or service, is going to get a, either a shoddier product or a more expensive product. And as Bill was saying, mm -hmm. the the, re the reality of it is that you have a life that has different facets to it. Right. The business itself has to be grounded in trust, but all these other aspects of your life also have to be grounded in trust. And there's no reason why you would not have the drive to be charitable and to be good natured mm -hmm. and to be welcoming right. and so on. But the, the further irony of it is that the government and politicians and regulators, their relationship to the people in this business firm is not one of trust. So they can do things right. which are not accountable. Mm -hmm. And as Bill was saying, the history of these uh, social responsible uh, policies is to provide essentially an apologia for interest groups to get control right. of the regulatory bodies mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. use them for their own purposes. Right. And so essentially progressivism and other explanations like this as a rationale end up being an excuse or a rational or apologia for what becomes corporatism.
and neo-mercantilism. So the, even the people who are legitimately trying to create a more ethical, humane society end up doing the opposite. Uh, this may seem tangential, but I've, a few years ago, I did some research on Abraham Lincoln, and there's this unusual, um, little known uh, thing he said. Of course, he was the one who was basically the protagonist for the establishment of the Republican Party. And he said during his campaign for president, apparently, that the Republican Party stands for the man and for the dollar. But in case of conflict, Lincoln said, for the man before the dollar. And I really appreciated that uh, that perspective. As to Milton Friedman, um, I don't think he deserved uh, that kind of criticism. You know, years ago when I was just starting to think about public life, I remember I read his book, Capitalism and Freedom, and it, it was extremely helpful to me uh, to put some yeah. of these things together. I recommend that book too. Well, people try to stereotype Milton um, as a public be damn, you know, the public be damn kind of an approach mm. with the robber barons and so forth. And it's really a naive view of the nature of business and human nature and and government power and all the rest of it. So, okay, all this other stuff is going on, uh, including woke football and the critique of Milton Friedman and so forth. And while this is happening, California out here is burning, um, <laughs> burning and burning, burning more than it has burned uh, ever before. And you know what I find really striking about uh, the coverage of California fires is that I kind of expected that the people who want to attribute it to climate change or global warming, whatever, would have the field all to themselves in the media. But surprisingly, I'm seeing a lot of news stories, even in the San Francisco Chronicle, for example, um, asking the question, you know, which is it? Um, is it lack of forest management or is it climate change? <clears throat> the very fact that question is being asked strikes me as a relatively healthy part of the debate over the California fires. What do you think about the fire situation, David? Well, it's interesting that when uh, uh, President Trump was out here uh, and he met with uh, Gavin Newsom in Sacramento, uh, Newsom volunteered that they have a serious problem in forest management. Now, he did- I admired him for admitting that. Right. And well, I, I, I also thought, though, it was uh, pecuniary because- yes. Yes, they got they got motives. money from the federal government for forest That's right. management. And That's he why to make he sure was he saying that. and thanking Trump, whatever for the mm -hmm. for the money. Um, the uh, the problem is there's a couple of problems. One problem is uh, take a, a longer view perspective is uh, there's serious scientific questions about the claims of climate alarmism and global warming scientifically. So we we'll just put that aside. But if the fires are caused by climate change, then why is it only in certain places on Earth? Why isn't it all over the Earth with the same conditions? But it's not. It's only in certain specific places that have these problems of forest mismanagement. So that should be a clue. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing more media raising these questions. Clearly, if we have uh, decades, if not 100 years, of dead wood piled up in these different forest land areas during the dry season. And whether it's caused by lightning or some sort of electrical equipment shortage or something, and it causes a fire, whether you have more solar panels will make no difference. Right. And so right. we have mm -hmm. to face the reality of this, but this, there are ideological interests. Um, uh, most of the major Environmental so groups if control. If a beetle infestation yes. goes through a forest, you should cut the trees down while they're still good for something. But the government won't let you cut the trees down, so they sit there and they get drier and drier and drier, yeah. and then they burn. And well, and then the inevitable natural natural flukes come, like the occasional lightning and so forth. Plus the man-made problems where PG and E's lines fall down because they invested in uh, solar and wind rather than in undergrounding their uh, power lines. And then you got problems. There's also some historical precedence to this, you know, going back to the time with Native, Amer Native Americans and how they treated the forest lands, but in the more recent uh, two or 300 years. And so, uh, and certainly in the last, uh, say, 30 years. So it's, it's pretty simple to diagnose this stuff, but there are people who don't want that to happen because they have 
primarily an ideological view in uh, wilderness. And uh, they believe that too many people and people shouldn't be living in the areas. And uh, the only way to get rid of them is to let the fires run rampant. I mean, there's, there's mm -hmm. a whole pers range of views, mm -hmm. but it's not exactly something that's helping the public or the forest. Right. To be fair, there is a somewhat tricky problem. So we should have controlled burns to deal with mm -hmm. some of this stuff. Like the Native American tribes did yep. way back. Maybe they did it that deliberately. Maybe some they did, did it to some chase did. game out of the forest. I don't know. But anyway, we're not going to treat them as perfectly benign either. But the, po the point is, if you have a controlled burn, A, it could get out of control. That scares people. B, it's smoky. Mm -hmm. And people don't want to bear the cost of the smoke. They say mm -hmm. to themselves, right. oh, yeah, I moved out in this area where it's bucolic, it's beautiful. Now you're telling me that part of the cost that I didn't know about before is that there has to be some control burning, otherwise I'm going to burn to death sometime later. Well, I'll take my chances on burning to death, or maybe it'll be my neighbor who burns to death. I don't want any smoke. And so mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a complicated problem. And I, I think to be fair to the, I think everything all of us have said is right, but this is an additional problem that's not as easy to deal with. But Bill, I think that those kinds of things can be approached. They can be. Um, by, you know, Ronald Coase, the Nobel laureate, wrote an essay That's called right. Theory of Social you Cost. Can figure, you can figure and he, he, one of his examples of this kind of a problem was someone who had an orchard. Right. And lo and behold, uh, this guy puts a railroad along the edge of the orchard, and the, or and the railroad is billing out smoke. It invades the orchard. Right. But the orchard owner wants the railroad still to get his product to market. So they cut a deal. Right. And so that's I think exactly that right. that's part of the the way you, uh, insurance is handled yeah. and tax credits and other things you can negotiate right. to minimize that. So essentially, to just go back to his example about the railroad and the apple orchard, you have to imagine that both the apple orchard and the railroad were like one piece of property. Now, what would the owner of that do? Now, let's try and negotiate to come to some solution that's close to what that owner would do if he owned both or she owned both. So that's what these people living out in the urban wilderness edge have to try to find their way to. And historically, people have been able to do it. But right now, with the not in my backyard mentality, they're finding some difficulty in getting to that place. I'm just saying that it's not just the not in my backyard part of it, which is true, is that the government, as you mentioned with the beetle infestation, is right. saying you can't do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And the common law tradition, the history of the common law, people were able to negotiate and reduce yeah. risk right. from yeah. their mutual benefit. So all these people like Ellickson and uh, Eleanor Ostrom and so yes, forth have that's right. gone into some of the experience that people have in making these kinds of arrangements, and we should respect that and try and enhance that kind of behavior. I can make another shameless plug. We have a book called Nature Unbound um, by Randy Simmons, Ryan Yonk, and Kenneth Sim. And it discusses these kinds of issues dealing with watersheds and all sorts of other natural resource issues. David, can I you think. also tell, tell our friends about our uh, recently published Golden Fleece uh, study on fires in California? Well, uh, our senior fellow, Lawrence McQuillan, who's director of our Center on Entrepreneurial Innovation, directs our California uh, Golden Fleece Award program, which is a quarterly program that awards, uh, presents an award to different government agencies. It's an award you don't want to get. Right. And <laughs> it, it's basically to point out malfeasance, fraud, uh, other crimes and, and misbehavior. And so we've done actually two of these awards on the wildfires over the years. We did one, I think it was 2017, and one in 2019. And uh, what Lawrence has talked about is the history of how this problem came into, into existence. And he presents a whole slew of very practical approaches to resolve the problem. It's not going to happen overnight because of the buildup of the dead wood is huge, but there's many things that can be done, including bringing in 
uh, private contractors to do the clearing and, and so on and so forth. So it's perfectly solvable, but the more they postpone this, the worse it will get and the worse the wildfires will get. And that's the reality of it. Graham, I wonder, to get back to our millenarians, if you would hold yeah. up the pursuit of the millennium for our viewers. Great book. This is a great book. Uh, I read it when I was a college undergraduate, and it impressed me then. And they had a different subtitle then, because it was the Cold War, so they tied it to totalitarianism. Now the subhead ties it to the counterculture. But the same essential book, he added one chapter. And uh, it talks about exactly the topics that we have been talking about in terms of uh, the fanatic pursuit pursuit of this perfect utopia that you could mm -hmm. just push over the edge if you suspended normal morality mm -hmm. and viewed That's yourself as exempt mm -hmm. from morality and you can do what you need to do or want to do and it will trigger this perfection and so right. let mm -hmm. let the violation of means for good ends go on yeah, and I would just encourage people to, uh, you know, put your radar on, use your discernment where you see the term systemic used. It will, half the time these days, conceal that kind of sort of spiritual uh, nihilism. Yeah. It's also a reflection of a certain uh, devotion to a worldview that is not working out. And... Uh, a fear and a sort of prideful refusal to reconsider, look at other viewpoints, maybe you're wrong, uh, maybe you don't have all the answers. And so you're pushed ever more into pursuing this vision with more extreme measures. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things that Independent Institute does is it raises questions about a lot of these uh, narratives that people have to see, well, all right, what you say about healthcare and housing and whatever is really true. Does it really hold up to the facts and to reason and to a moral sense? So uh, I think that in some respects, what we're seeing, what's been building over the last few years is a frustration um, with people who have had the view that their views were ones they could have complete confidence in and were being uh, pursued uh, with a certain deliberation, but now they don't control the conversation. Uh, they're not getting what they want, and they're fearful that bad things will happen, I think, in many cases. But a lot of it is simply this, this in, in enhanced sense of pride, but by golly, they're not going to let any other view rise and be considered mm -hmm. They're going right. to try and, you know, it's the cancel, cancel culture. Cancel. It's right. the intolerance on campus. It's, mm -hmm. you know, Hollywood, they, they, the Academy of Wars just adopted these new measures that to be uh, nominated or picked as a best picture, you now have to mm -hmm. include, you have to check certain boxes as far as the that diversity. That was a very funny thing on right. Babylon B. They said yes. Academy uh, calls back. Uh, uh, Oscar from Schindler's List because That's right. it didn't have all the check off. Oh man. Exactly. <laughs> and so you can't portray. I'm only Oliver, laughing because it's so horrible. But anyway. It, yeah. It Oliver was Stone was, there, Oliver Stone was asked this, uh, the other night. He has a new book out, uh, a memoir. And he was saying that he couldn't, you know, he couldn't make Platoon. He couldn't make a lot of these films that he once made because he wouldn't be able to check all these boxes which actually would detract from the storyline of what he's trying to depict. Whether you like the film or not, that's the reality of what's happening. There's a compulsion now in, in the light of this kind of millenarian thing, uh, you know, always mining for uh, more and more evidence of wrongdoing. It, it's kind of like what Mao Zedong instituted in China during the Cultural Revolution. You've got to eradicate the mindset of private property and the mindset of, uh, that doesn't go along with the, uh, the vision of a communalistic future. Uh, and so you're always rooting out some new horrible thing. So, you know, some of it is comical. 
like what's this latest thing, Bill? You told me something about how there's a Cornell. Yes, there's a group at Cornell yes. <laughs> that's demanding to know the race of faculty spouses. Unbelievable. Spouses. I mean, yeah. what kind of identity politics is it that counts up and tallies and bean counters faculty spouses race? Yeah. Another kind of thing along maybe cousin of that is that the University of Chicago, one of the preeminent, Cornell is of course a great university, University of Chicago is a great university. The English department there said, don't bother applying as a graduate student unless your field is black studies. That's right. Exactly. Wow. Uh, yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, what, what about if you're interested in Beowulf and you're a great potential scholar? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's out, I guess. It's out. I mean, and then there's this thing about Columbia University's marching band. Yes. Uh, they have apparently self-disbanded because they discovered yeah. somewhere in an archive that one of the early founders of the thing was pro-slavery or something, which is no, obviously regrettable, but it has nothing no. to do with the work of the marching band. It's not band, that. It's not they've that. decided it's to self-denounce themselves and disband themselves. Although, to be sure, there was some question whether there was some financial issue with the university that may complicate that picture. A little bit. You and I read different stories on this, but uh, I think the, the claims that I read is that people confessed or accused things having to do with uh, relations between the sexes, race mm -hmm. relations, um, sexual orientation problems, people mm -hmm. maybe mocking or making jokes about whatever sacred topics now. And that this is what this is a very this is a scramble band instead of a normal kind of Prussian style marching oh, band. Mm -hmm. This is like UC Berkeley band, sort of marching band. Kind of weird that this is at Berkeley versus the Stanford band, which is a scramble band, is always making off color jokes and whatever. So, and the Stanford band got suspended by the university a few times for this. So, but anyway, the point is they decided they couldn't handle the controversy and their consciences were so overwhelmed, according to the story I read, <laughs> yeah. that they uh, liquidated themselves. And we, we don't know whether they were pushed by the university, not wanting to right. handle this, but their alumni association said, this is all lies. And that was not the characteristic of the culture internally of the band. And oh, good. this was a travesty. So yeah. not, this is not the Columbia Alumni Association. This is the Columbia Band Alumni Association. Right. But all these, all these stories are uh, some funny, some you know, tragic, all relate to the same issue of yeah. treating people as members of, of groups. Right. Um, and uh, instead group of group identity, a, group or, guilt, right? And uh, by the way, the, the idea of intersectionality, of you know how many different Venn diagrams of group identity overlap you, um, and uh, to Jordan Peterson's credit, one of the things he pointed out is the more groups that you include in intersectionality, as you go towards infinity, you end up with lo and behold individuals, right. and so. Um, the examples of, for example, um, uh, these two women, uh, one who is the head of the NAACP in Spokane, um, and, and there are other examples too, um, who just decided, I, think it was, it was, I guess the historian at George Washington University yes, that's right. Right. admitted historian. that she was not black after all. And then, of course, you got Elizabeth Warren, who's claimed to be Cherokee all these years. But in all these cases, instead of talking about the individual and taking responsibility and realizing that, you know, from a so-called methodological individual's perspective, you have a mind, you have a soul, you act, you're responsible, you can achieve things, but you can only do things in this sort of collective um, identity politics. You have to do it only in, in, in concert with others of that group. And so it's a great way to keep people down. And that's essentially... I think what we're seeing more and more is that people who can, who subscribe to that are basically, especially for their kin, 
they're basically asking to keep everyone down in perpetuity. All these weirdnesses are part of this uh, ideological compulsion that is, in fact, um, at work in our society. Um, sadly, um, a lot of it is deliberately fomented by people who are trained in this kind of ideological thinking. Um, we encourage American citizens to you know, keep your eyes open for this kind of a thing. I mean, don't overreact, um, yeah. but don't go along with something just because somebody says, you know, you, you got to confess your guilt of some kind or other. Uh, because these things, these confusions are allied, unfortunately, in practice with a history of violence. Um, you know, the, the kind of ideological group against group uh, which preceded uh, the rise of National Socialism in Germany and elsewhere. We've seen this kind of thing before, uh, and it, 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 it goes toward coercion. Um, coercion is not what we need. Uh, we need a vision of, of society where people have a basic understanding of what's right and wrong. They respect one another as individual persons. Um, and uh, we cooperate as much as we can. We know we can't bring in a perfect utopia. Uh, let's, uh, let's keep our heads on straight. <laughs> That's basically what I'd say as we come to a conclusion here. Any final comments from either of you? Yes, I would, of course, co concur completely in what you're saying, but add that street fighting is not a good sign of social health. No, it so sure is So if isn't. you go back to the early 1920s in Italy, when the fascists had uh, a little army, private army called the Squadistras that at attacked uh, leftists and leftists were taking over factories violently. If you go back to the 1920s and 1930s in Germany, you had the Freikorps, you had uh, the Schutzbund of the socialists, you had the Communists had their own fighting group. The Nazis had the stormtroopers and the protective echelon. Mm -hmm. And all these people were engaging in street fighting. Street fighting. Vienna, right. street violence. Vienna had mm -hmm. some of the same thing. And it's not a sign of social health. We need to yeah. have people arguing, respecting each right. other. That's right and seeking justice, but seeking it at its objective base. Mm -hmm. And Tifa looks pretty fascistic, even though they're supposed to be anti-fascistic. Yeah, and you know, an, did, you, did you see this thing that the, the Guardian, you know, kind of a left-leaning paper in Britain, just published a study indicating that two-thirds of U.S. young adults don't know, two-thirds of them don't know uh, that during that period of uh, history you're talking about in the uh, mid 20th century, they don't know that six million Jews were killed by government government's actions during the Holocaust. Stunning. So a, a, a substantial number, like 10%, think Jews initiated the Holocaust. Yeah, Unbelievable. That's right. That's right. These things can really go wrong. So let's let's keep our eyes open. So we're discussing too much of the. Uh, ethnic studies of Pacific Islanders and not enough of the mass murder by Stalin and Hitler. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not that I'm in favor of injustices to Pacific Islanders and yeah, things right. that went on in the Hawaiian Islands that Grover Cleveland rightly condemned. But, you know, let's, it, it, this is a fan, fantastic number that this number of young people do not know what the Holocaust was. That's right. Mm -hmm. And also this idea of identity politics to sort of bring it down to a familiar, familial and personal level is that children should not be told that their value is because they're members of some group. They should be right. taught their right. value because of their person mm -hmm. and they have uh, integrity and they have worth and dignity. And if we treat humanity um, in terms of these identities. Uh, we're asking for trouble, and it's, re it's really an incredibly abusive and unjust way to treat any human being. And of course, as you're mentioning, Bill and Graham both, and also getting back to Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man, Lewis builds up this book, and at the end, you understand exactly why he raised the original questions that he did in the beginning of the book, because he's pointing out that the, the horrors under under Nazism and communism are directly traceable to this denial of uh, objective ethics and good behavior. Let me offer thanks to David Thoreau and to Williamson Evers. Uh, 
Thank you also to all of our friends who joined us today. We do encourage you to turn to the Independent Institute for resources on, on these and so many other matters. We are an association of scholars uh, around the U.S. and some overseas uh, who are committed to serious and rigorous research on the basis of which we try and analyze uh, what society needs to understand to get some of these things right uh, and undo some of the confusion. So we invite you to go to www.independent.org um, and join us next time on The Independent Outlook. Thanks, friends. Thanks, David. Thank you very much. And thanks, Bill. Thank you. And thanks, ThinkSpot. And thanks, ThinkSpot. Absolutely. Take care, everybody. <laughs>